Hello, welcome to The Fix. My name's Aaron Bastani. I'm James Butler. And we're going to be talking about the biggest stories of, I think, not just today, but my adult life, the weirdest, wackiest stories I think we could possibly imagine. Really incredibly strange. It's been such a strange few days. So we're talking about, firstly, um, the remarkable story uh, uncovered by, it seems, much of the British print media that Jeremy Corbyn was, in fact, a Czechoslovak asset during the Cold War. With the code name Cobb. Agent Cobb. <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty big story, right? You and would think. You would think. And then, uh, and then in addition to that, we'll be talking about fees. We will be. We'll be talking about Theresa May's conversion to the cause of education. Woke Theresa May. Oh, woke Theresa May, may but maybe not. <laughs> right, so starting with Agent uh, Cobb, as he's called. Um, really remarkable story. This was broken initially by The Sun, wasn't it, last week? And then I think a lot of us wrote it off. We thought, of, you know, it's just The Sun. And then it was picked up by The Telegraph, by The Mail. Uh, and then you had some pretty impressive influences. Repeat it. So if we can just get these up. Niall Ferguson, who's, who's actually a pretty decent historian. Well, who might have once been a yeah. pretty decent historian. He's a Harvard historian. He was a decent historian back in the day before he started writing trash for money and influence. Right. right. <laughs> but there's, uh, there's Ferguson and then we've got Dan Snow. Did that just come up a second ago? At, I think, the history guy he's called. <laughs> yeah. What histori like historiographical school says you use the sun as a source? Uh, the yellow press history tradition of the Is late that... 19th century. I mean, it's a really curious thing to... You would imagine that anyone who was familiar with British history would at least think, hmm, this looks like a Zinoviev letter situation. Yeah. I mean, this looks like, you know, there is a long tradition here of, uh, of smears made up by uh, uh, the British press, uh, particularly with left-wing Labour leaders. Um, but yeah, no, the, 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 the kind of histrionic response from people like this, not historiographical, Histrionic. That's really important to say, right? <laughs> That's really important to say. Because this is what I want to talk about. I always talk about confirmation bias and bandwagoning bias. Mm -hmm. And these people want to pass themselves off as ultra-rational, ultra-objective. And yet, somebody who's a Harvard historian will gleefully, gleefully, if you actually read uh, Ferguson's tweet, uh, reference a story by The Sun newspaper. Mm. And I mean, this really just does... Uh, I think betoken a certain kind of, like I say, confirmation bias within within the mainstream media. Now, why would they do that? Why would he so happily make an idiot of himself? Well, because a central Jeremy Corbyn government doesn't just uh, conflict with his political values, it fundamentally undermines his material interests as somebody who's now in the, the, the bourgeoisie, the middle class, okay? Although he will say, I came from a Glasgow council estate. Well, you don't anymore, yes, Niall. Yes, yes, So that's what matters. Uh, and then we've got... The Sun's Tom Newton Dunn. What do you make of this one, James? This is what he said here. There is little hard evidence. Corbyn was a paid-up spy, but he admits meeting a Czech intelligence officer who he says he thought was only a diplomat to talk. And this happened four times over 18 months in 1986 to 7. This questions his judgment. Right. Uh, 1986 to 7, not the height of the Cold War. Perestroika underway by this point, really. Thawing, really going on. When was Red October, the film, released? Yeah, uh, later, I think. All right. Uh, I'm, but but you, I'm no cinema buff. So I mean, the Cold War is effectively over by the release of Red October. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's become yeah. a kind of joke. Yeah, 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 Sean Connery is now... You know, the Soviets are no longer these very scary people. They're now uh, uh, Ivan Drago uh, in Rocky IV <laughs> and Sean Connery <laughs> as some guy who's got a, a speech impediment and a Scottish ac yeah. accent as a Russian admiral. <laughs> Clearly the cob was over by then, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, I think, you know, the, the other thing here is that uh, these people are trying to whip this up into, into a kind of story about, you know, as if it were, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, Kim Philby um, sort hey. of... Well, you, your man, your man who's, who said this? One of the... Uh, uh, this is Ben Wallace just, yes. uh, just, a, couple of, just a couple of hours ago on Twitter um, following in the, on the heels, hot on the heels, of Ben Bradley MP. Yeah. Um, so Ben Wallace uh, compared Corbyn to... Uh, to, to Kim Philby, who's one of the Cambridge spies, of course, went and lived out a miserable existence in the USSR after selling uh, uh, British secrets to, to, to the USSR, as was at the time. Um, I mean, this is, you know, this is laughable. It is laughable. And the thing, the thing, the thing I think that is really key here is to just may, maybe pick apart this guy 
a little bit. This, uh, what's his name? This uh, 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 Sarkozy, Sarkozy, I don't know how you yeah. say it. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a guy who seems to believe that Czechoslovak spies helped fund and organise Live Aid. Um, uh, who, who, uh, but nonetheless, I mean, even he, even he at first, in the first version of this story that he told The Sun, says that the, uh, you know, the knowledge couldn't be utilised because the, the knowledge they gained from Corbyn was of a limited nature. Um, he was negative towards the USA. <laughs> Don't... <laughs> And the, <laughs> and the Conservative Party. <laughs> yeah, very important. Very, very important. unpatriotic. Well, he also keeps dogs and fish. And also, he's, he was uh, a very... Uh, this guy, this Sarkozy guy, very close to Winnie Mandela. <laughs> and apparently he knew what Margaret Thatcher had for breakfast every morning. Yes, and what she was going to wear that day. Now, th this guy, after he has had some attention, has now uh, taken to the press and say, uh, he's now saying that he has a... Uh, he's got a, uh, he, he had a, he ran a ring of 10 to 15 Labour MPs mm. who were paid £10,000 for hey, this is just the meeting. This is the Czechoslovaks, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how many yeah. do the Soviets have? I mean, this is a completely ludicrous story. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think the thing that's interesting is that, uh, you know, the Sun really knew what they were doing here, right? They, they, they did this thing that they always do, which is create uh, a little bit of a kind of, uh, fake news storm, mm. uh, it, you know, among the right wing kind of debating chambers, among the echo chambers. Mm. Guido gets involved, uh, really stirs it up. You know, the sun drip feeds this stuff. And eventually people start talking about it. Someone, you know, some patsy from the press asked Theresa May a question about it. And now that the prime minister has mentioned it, then it's fair play for the right wing press, uh, the more respectable right wing press, to go into it probably tomorrow. I would imagine um, that they're going to chase this down. Uh, you know, I imagine some patsy Tory MP will ask a question during PMQs tomorrow and try and keep the story alive a little bit longer. It's a very predictable playbook. Can we get up the tweet from John Hemmings from the Henry Jackson Society? <laughs> can we get that up? What does he say, this, this, this idiot? What, can you read that for me, James? You're... How could a self-proclaimed human rights champion have found things to admire in police states like Czechoslovakia and the GDR, which imprisoned and tortured dissidents? A nice photo of Corbyn on his Chairman Mao-style bicycle okay, there as so look, well. First of all, that's from a Matthew Dancona article in The Guardian. Yeah. Here's the reality about Jeremy Corbyn. He signed a parliamentary motion uh, praising striking workers against what he called the, quote, Stalinist bureaucracy of the Czechoslovak government. He was friends with dissidents in Islington and elsewhere in London uh, in the final years of the Iron Curtain. Matthew Dancona, how many fucking dissidents did you know in the late 1980s? I bet, I know, I bet it was none, okay? So shut the fuck up. And then you had this, uh, it was Sebastian Payne. Oh, the um, uh, little dweeb boy who works for the Financial Times. This slapstick popping jay of the financial <laughs> press. You know, he was, he was praising it as well. And you just think, okay, I understand The Guardian has to cover these things and they obviously need a right-wing journalist in there for balance. I think this is ridiculous. I think, also then Dan Kona, by the way, Compared to Tim Shipman, he knows fuck all. He's got zero value. Here we go. Oh my god. Yeah, I mean, I this have is to the say, worst take I have of to all. Say that my response to everything Matthew Dancona has ever written is, "Who cares?" Um, he's wrong he's about everything. Startlingly dull writer, uh, and extremely. It's extremely difficult to get to the end of one of the columns without falling asleep. I mean, you mentioned there the dissidents, and I think this is an important point actually. You know, it's in, you know, this is the you know, Corbyn is the kind of person who would have been involved and was involved in talking to kind of Charter 77 dissidents. Exactly. Uh, that stuff is really, really important. And also, as I mentioned earlier, these smears are, are the kind of things that got trotted out even against right-wing Labour leaders like Kinnock. Kinnock you had uh, described as having uh, Kinnock's Kremlin connection by the Sunday Times in the 1992 election, accused of red connections uh, based on a meeting with a Soviet ambassador in the 1980s. Mm. Well, let me tell you the number of people in the right-wing press who palled up with Augusto Pinochet, right up to the evil witch queen herself, Margaret Thatcher, who, mm. of course, admired and gave asylum to Pinochet when he was, uh, uh, you know, running away from the consequences of his many, many political murders and uh, executions. We also had, of course, in 1995, the Sunday Times story on Michael Foote, uh, based on Soviet bloc files again, with the headline, KGB, <laughs> Michael Foote was our agent. And, you know, you know, by July of that year, the newspaper had, of course, apologised and paid out quite substantial damages. Now, on, on the question of legal action, of course, um, we had, I think, uh, do we have the Ben Bradley tweet? Do we have that? 
Um, Get Humpty Dumpty up. Yes, here we go. So this is Ben Bradley, uh, who, who tweeted this. Uh, Corbyn sold British secrets to communist spies. <clears throat> Get some perspective, <clears throat> mate. Your priorities are a bit awry. Hashtag, are you serious? What, well, se what secrets in the late 80s? <laughs> well, okay, what so secrets? This is, this had, is a privati who... had a privatised shit? Had no. to sell oil off for cheap? <laughs> so this is the what thing? secrets? So, okay, for, for one thing, so here's the really funny thing. Uh, Corbyn in the late 1980s, an avowed member of the peace movement, uh, the anti-nuclear movement, CND, uh, not a privy councillor, so the state secrets that he'd have been privy to would be questionable. But yes, that, that is a really good question about what British secrets might actually be. What were there in the British 80s? British secret, be born into aristocracy and fail your way upwards through the rest of life. That's Case possible. study, the yeah. Home Secretary. That's possible. Uh, you know, get, you know the, this, uh, the, the, conduct partition and brutal oppression across the world, including on your next door neighbour, and somehow managed to have an international reputation uh, as anything other than a rogue state yeah. based on liking gin and tea. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, how the fuck anyone thinks something called bread sauce is nice? Uh, this is a real thing. <laughs> bread sauce. This is a real thing. Bread sauce no. is a thing that actually exists. It, no. It is, it is, You're having is, me um, on. No, no, no. This is what middle class, upper middle class people put on food. Um, uh, I, I have tasted it once. It actually looks like kind of vomit. It looks like the kind of thing that, you know, a, a, a baby throws up after. How can know. bread be a sauce? Uh, well, God alone knows. These days people buy it in a packet <laughs> and pour hot water onto it and then take the grey no. vegetables and, and cover it in that. No, it's, it's really kind of sweet tasting, kind of gruel-like, quite revolting. Uh, yeah, no. Can I, we get I, a picture up of the... Oh, there you go. <laughs> Does there it? we go. Hey, that looks quite good. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's really not. It, you really don't want it. But no, I mean, so, so to be serious for a moment, though, this is... So Ben Bradley put this tweet up uh, about an hour before we came on air tonight. Uh, a spokesman for Jeremy Corbyn said, uh, we have instructed a lawyer to send a letter to Ben Bradley to instruct him to delete his libelous tweet. Ben Bradley has deleted his libelous tweet. Um, now, you might think it's done the kind of work that he wanted it to do. Um, you might also think uh, that, that this kind of thing, uh, is it strange for a leader of the opposition? Shouldn't a politician expect to be slandered and libeled? Maybe that's true. But this is exactly the kind of political signalling that led to a man who was obsessed with you know, far-right conspiracies against the British people, fashioning or buying a gun off some source uh, and assassinating Joe Cox in the run-up. To, to the election last year. This is exactly the same kind of paranoid, enemy of the people, enemy of Britain scaremongering mm. that led to that murder. And I think it's absolutely right to come down hard on it. And I think it is frankly fucking disgraceful that people who are supposed to be public servants are engaged in exactly this kind of red scare baiting, which includes, by the way, Paul Staines, who has described himself as, you know, a, a fanatical, uh, zealot-like anti-communist, you know, who gladly participated in running guns to the Contras. He writes about this. Uh, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> participated in, in, in raising <clears throat> funds for uh, UNITA in Angola, a yep. sort of murderous anti-communist, anti-socialist, anti-left uh, guerrilla group, uh, you know, has defended as recently as just a few years ago, has defended the regime of Augusto Pinochet in Chile. These are the people, uh, you know, who, who, who are behind you know, these, these storms who are behind this kind of despicable behaviour and we shouldn't give them the time of day. Frankly, they should be hounded out of public life entirely. I cannot believe that we allow, uh, you know, the, the, the agenda for the media to be set by people like Paul Staines, who has blood on his hands. He's a murderer. <laughs> he's a, he's a, yeah. Paul Staines is a murderer. <laughs> he writes about going into the Contras and firing off AK-47s. He, he for says fun? he was firing off AK-47s in Joburg, I believe, while you know palling around with these kind of people. You know, he says he never wore a Hang Mandela badge, but he hung out with people at the Federation for Conservative Students who did. So that's Paul Staines. No, he, he's quite. He's quite upfront about it. He says, "Look, this was just yeah, cause. Yeah, yeah. These were my politics. It's a civil war." And, you know, to an yeah, extent, yeah, and he says he has no regrets. He says he has no regrets. I'm sure none of it was. I'm sure none of it was illegal. But do you want these people, like you say, setting the press agenda in a liberal democracy? Yeah, yeah, I yeah, certainly yeah. don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the other thing that Ben Bradley is trying to do here, which is connected to this kind of stoking up of these right wing fears, is exactly you know the kind of cultural war strategy that we've talked about a bit before, um, both on the Fix previously, but also on Navarre FM. That these people really want because it's the last. Thing they have. Now, Ben Bradley also applauding a, a, a conservative activist for calling Owen Jones a little fag 
uh, on Twitter the other day. This is a guy who's really uh, getting behind this kind of culture war stuff, and I think it really has to be stamped out as soon as possible. But he's also really stupid. He's also really, he really is dumb. Also, can we get up this, this tweet? We'll, we'll go to a break in a bit, but we'll get up this tweet where um, I tweeted it earlier on today. It's from the Stephen Nolan programme, if you guys could pull it up. Um, I mean, it's remarkable. I mean, he's new, and he's one of the more sort of promising... He's not 30 yet, is he? Uh, God alone knows. He's 29, sort of 28? Looks, 28, 29. MP yeah, yeah. for Mansfield, yeah, majority yeah, 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 of about, yeah. I think, 1,050, yeah, 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 80. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in our sites for next time, you know, I mean, like, you know, there's got to be a campaign there to unseat this guy. This guy is real, real poison. Well, this is why him and Anna Subri in particular... Oh, work soups. Every time uh, Owen Jones does this unseat thing, they get, like, really triggered. You know, and they start spewing nonsense yeah, on Twitter. So the snowflake, right? Yeah, and you go, well, and they start saying, "Oh, this abuse can't. What abuse can't carry on? What campaigning to win a parliamentary seat mm. in a democratic manner with a political party? I mean, mm. it's just a nonsense." Have we got that tweet yet with Ben Bradley? This is remarkable. If you can't, then I'll just. I'll, this is not. It's not it. It's not it. It was a tweet. <laughs> it's my tweet. It was with Stephen Nolan, mm -hmm. and Stephen Nolan says, "You know, what's going on? Brexit." This is the week when uh, we found out there was no plan in regards to mm -hmm. the Irish border and that they were talking to the Republic without, you know, processing things to DUP. And he said, we're making it up as we go along. You know, I mean, and I, that's when it hit me. I got, it was like a ton of bricks. Oh, actually, this guy's just really thick. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But yeah, so these are, these are the people who want this kind of right-wing media storm. They want these, these things. I doubt this we'll hear more about it. It's such a bullshit story. The other thing I would say before we move on to Theresa May's conversion... Uh, to to the cause of uh, free, well, not free, somewhat reduced education. She's now uh, an NCAF member. <laughs> she's, got, she's now got a position on fees to the left of much of the Parliamentary Labour Party. <laughs> the, 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 the thing I would say just before, before we move on to that is that this is a prime case for the need for Leveson too. Yes. Um, now, it's in the manifesto of the Labour Party. It was also, I believe, in the manifesto of a small party which no longer has any relevance whatsoever. They're yellow um, and support Tories wherever they can, so we won't talk about them. But, it, you know, it is worth just mentioning. Now, this was an inquiry that was supposed to feed on from, from the previous iteration of Leveson, which is going to be a wider inquiry about the kind of criminal behaviour of both News of the World and other papers, uh, as well as corruption in the police. Uh, around these things, around kind of these source, the sourcing of these stories. And, and, you know, these people, the people who own these papers and the people who edit these papers, papers like The Sun, um, papers like The Telegraph, are running shit scared of Leveson 2. They of course. really, really oh don't want it. Uh, and whereas Theresa May has announced her inquiry into the sustainability of the press with a whisper that in order to keep uh, quality journalism mm. like... Um, Czech spy Corbyn alive, she might think about subsidising the dead tree press. So there you go. Those are the two things on offer. Bungs for Murdoch mm. or actually having this stuff come to light. I mean, I think that's quite a stark choice. Very stark choice. We're going to talk about fees in a minute. I think we're going to go to a break. We'll go to a break. Right, Ben, let, let's start with you. How has your government demonstrated that you're capable of delivering Brexit, given the absolute shambles we've seen over the last couple of days. <laughs> um, look, this is a completely unprecedented thing, isn't it? This is what people seem to forget. There is no rule book to follow. There is no, um, you know, history of this happening that you can go out and find the best practice and go and do it. It's, you know, one way or the other, they are both sides, EU, UK government, essentially having to make it up as they go along because there is no example of this. So it's not surprising that it's difficult. It's not surprising that, um, you know, everything doesn't go perfectly to time and to plan. Have you just um, heard yourself? It's not an easy thing. Have you just heard what you have just said out of your mouth? You're working it out as you go along. But what, uh, what's the other option? The alternative? What plan do you follow? Of course, We're there's a, a, a plan in the minds this. of government. A plan. A thoughtful plan. The Absolutely. greatest minds you in the know. UK sitting down and over the last 12 months thinking to themselves, oh, I wonder how the DUP might react if we do a deal with the Irish government and don't tell them. The Irish border. We the Irish yeah, border we were talking out. about for, you know, we've been talking about for nearly every day for a year. And yet you've let the cat out of the very top of the interview, Ben. You're making it up as you go along. So it's Theresa May time. And uh, now fees were good. Now they are bad, but also good. So Theresa May has uh, experienced a kind of conversion to something you and I could have told her 
seven years ago, mm -hmm. which is that uh, universities uh, are going to uh, will act like cartels uh, when it comes to uh, being able to set their own fees. Uh, the market doesn't work, uh, and that we live in well. Let's hear it in her own words, shall we? We've got a video of Theresa May giving her speech today in Derby about tuition fees. Through education, we can become a country where everyone from every background gains the skills they need to get a good job and live a happy and fulfilled life. To achieve that, we must have an education system at all levels which serves the needs of every child. And if we consider the experience which many young people have of our system as it is today, it's clear that we don't have such a system today. The competitive market between universities, which the system of variable tuition fees envisaged, has simply not emerged. All but a handful of universities charge the maximum possible fees for undergraduate courses. Three-year courses remain the norm, and the level of fees charged do not relate to the cost or quality of the course. So we now have one of the most expensive systems of university tuition in the world. So now is the time to take action, to create a system that is flexible enough to ensure that everyone gets the education that suits them. And that's what the review which I'm launching today sets out to deliver. So we have her announcing today that we have the most expensive or one of the most expensive tuition systems in the world, a system for which Theresa May voted, um, the objections to which everything she's just outlined in that speech was said to her and said to them and said to the government well ahead of it happening. It was raised in Parliament, it was raised by students, it was raised during the protests, it was raised in lobbying, it was raised throughout. Now, of course, we don't think that this is all about evidence-based policy making and that she's holding her hands up and going, oh, I was wrong, because she's not reversing the system at all. But what is important is that she's announced this inquiry where she says uh, that, you know, it's going to be chaired by a city economist. Uh, Brilliant. <laughs> there might be a little bit of a reduction in fees for some courses, um, which will inevitably force struggling universities to charge lower fees for poorer students, so you get more striation in the higher education system, uh, a striation which already exists. Uh, and, you know, it's supposed to run for a year, report in early 2019, and so it's really kicking the issue into the long grass for a while. But I think it's really striking here, actually, that she, you know, she says things like, oh, there should be greater focus on technical education, but she refuses to give a target of how many people are going to go to university. It's just a kind of completely baffling failure on her part. I mean, politically, it looks really, really bizarre. She was a senior member of the government that brought in these things. She mm. defended them. She defended them in interviews. She defended them in Parliament. Mm. She voted for them. It encourages a cartel. Uh, you know, it, you know, and one of the places you can see this happening, you know, the gradual, you know, uh, pulling apart of the university system is in the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, which are really selling out the UCU strike. They're, you know, not using their power. Next to, week? Uh, well, it's ongoing, so it's a rolling course of series. In of London, strikes, we've there got is strikes, next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yep, yep, yep. and uh, <laughs> you know, obviously we support the strike uh, and we would encourage everyone watching to support the strike as well if you're in a, a higher education institution. You can find out more about that at the UCU website. You can find out more about it. It's an excellent article on the LRB blog by Wasim Yacoub from Cambridge. Um, but so all the things that we're saying are wrong, we could have told her years ago. And the economics of this stuff is mad as well. It, you know, the, the uprating on debt still uses RPI. That, you know, extracts more cash from students. Um, you know, punitive uh, measures such as uh, a, a, you get a punishment add-on if you don't notify the student loan company that you've moved house, despite the fact that this stuff is clawed back in PAYE for most employees anyway. Anyway, it's all technical stuff, and this is all no, a good, good reason. I mean, I've not paid back a penny on my student loan. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I pay that back a very little. Well, okay, and I the mean, thing I, is, I'm exaggerating. The thing is, is that, that, <laughs> the thing is that three quarters of graduates now will not repay. I've not paid the, the principal, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I, mean I know yeah, yeah, I've, I've, No, I've paid some of the debt off, yeah. but some of the interest off. Um, but yeah, so there, this is, of course, a good reason to abolish all student debt. Uh, this is a good reason to abolish tuition fees. And what's so baffling about this as a political move is that she's come out with this technocratic policy that she already knows won't work, that experts in the field are saying this doesn't sound like it will work and will have really deleterious effects on higher education as a whole. And 
it looks much less attractive and much less easy to understand than Labour's proposal, which is that they should be abolished. So I mean, God knows what she thinks <clears throat> she's doing. Well, firstly, and this is really weird, is she's highlighted a problem and then she's not offered a solution. Yeah. I mean, it's literally the worst possible thing you can do on any policy subject. Then she said, and I found this very odd, she wants fees to be lower for human humanities degrees. And she's saying, well, they have less capital investment, which is true. To, to train a doctor costs a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But we need doctors. We need engineers. You know, I'm a humanities student myself. We also need humanities students. But clearly when you've got, I think right now A&Es are about, I think we need an extra 5,000 doctors in the NHS. You know, the priority you'd imagine would be on training people that are going to work in key public services. And of course, she uh, keeps the tier two visa cap on, so it's not like you can import them no, anyway. No. So, so the, I found this particularly interesting, not because I agree or disagree, but because it's going to be out of kilter with what the majority of conservatives mm, think. Mm, mm, now, I, I actually think most conservatives, if you said engineers, doctors, STEM subjects, they shouldn't have to pay fees, they'd go, yep. Yeah. yeah and yeah, they yeah, would yeah. say, oh, David Beckham studies, they should have to pay fees. And what Theresa May is actually saying, is the opposite, yeah. Yeah, yeah. which it's, I just, I can't really quite fathom what she's thinking. Well, the thing that's interesting about this is that actually this is a Nick Timothy idea. And so the cold, dead hand <clears throat> of crap Rasputin comes back from the grave. He looks terrible. He does look terrible. If we can Do get we have an image of Nick Timothy? If we can Timothy? get a picture of Nick Timothy up. Have an image of Nick Timothy? My maybe. God. Um, he really does look awful. Uh, anyway. Uh, maybe we'll have Can that I also say There's a big political factor here, isn't there? If you're an uh, opponent, if, if this, uh, you're the Labour Party... He's, he's, he's not 40 yet, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, so, so the, the thing that I thought was, was really, really striking... Right? So he had said, he said that this is something that he had wanted to do and he'd been blocked by Justine Greening and Jay Johnson. Um, so this is Theresa May, out of ideas, coming back to Nick Timothy. Um, Nick Timothy called tuition fees and an ultimately pointless Ponzi scheme. Now, obviously, she's not, she's not courageous enough to go with this stuff, yeah. isn't it? but she also doesn't have any other policy ideas. She's floating, rudderless, she has no friends, she has no advisors. She is a complete concoction. You know, she was invented by Nick Timothy and Fiona Hill. She was made, this is a woman who's very introverted, who is not charming, who is not a political performer. She was invented whole cloth by these two advisors that she's been forced to cut loose. And no wonder she's going back to these kind of zombie versions of their ideas. Mm. But, you know, it just doesn't seem to be working And now we're st And now she's stuck with the human lollipop that is Gavin Barwell. <laughs> If we can, if we can get, I'm not joking. If we can get Gavin Barwell up, he looks yeah, like a he looks these, like a toffee apple. He's one of these amazing people in politics who managed to look both three years old and sixty years old at the same time. Sort of boss baby of the conservative so, right. Can I say this is for this, this is quite interesting for me? Is that um, what Theresa May is doing at the moment? I think is sort of reminiscent of um, uh, Hillary Clinton and a kind of a lot of the melt centre left. So it's identifying a big problem. And then offering like a really weird, like mm, as Paul, mm, Paul mm, Moses mm. says, altering the cufflinks. Yeah. So she's yeah. saying, you know, what? Well, uh, you, you, Hillary Clinton was doing this a lot in the campaign trial, right? So she'd say, like, well, actually, we want to have a negative income tax, and it'll be over three years against the principal on the margin, <laughs> and then it'll be inverted to the ratio, which will be relative to future income indexed against age and income inequality. Yeah, yeah. yeah Nobody yeah. knows what you're talking about. Absolutely, absolutely. Simple you know, policy. <clears throat> Scrap tuition fees. No, that's completely. We keep. Is this Barwell? No, that was Barwell's Get Barwell head up. flashing up subliminally, um, like Get, some sort of monstrous. Christ Almighty! What, <clears throat> what a monstrous looking. He looks like a lollipop. He does. Um, so, but anyway, the, my point is this: politically, I mean, Labour's just so yeah, much easier to understand. Yeah, yeah. So there is something I wanted to talk about, which links to our earlier story, which is to do with fake news on this subject. And I, for my sins, listened to the Radio Four. BBC Radio 4 Today programme in the morning. It's on my, my alarm goes off in the morning. I have an hour of, of the Today programme. This is the Catholic in you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, feel I begin my day with mortification. Rather than the, the cat of nine tails. Yeah. But so I was astonished this morning to hear John Humphreys, who's paid £600,000 per annum by the BBC, um, interviewing Nicky Morgan. And we have the clip, so let's go to the clip and just listen to it because it's quite amazing. There's a big political factor here, isn't there? If you're an uh, opponent, if, if this, uh, you're the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn says, yeah, this is what we're going to do. And, we, we're, and, and we're going to offer students uh, maintenance grants as well. You've got a struggle on for the youth vote in the next election. 
Well, I think it's a bit more sophisticated than that. I and mean, I think pretty soon after the election, uh, as far as I can remember, Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell both said, oh, well, we're not sure we, we, we're going to abolish it. It was all you know, a promise made in the heat of an election that they knew was absolutely unaffordable. And I think young people know that too. And the young people that uh, I meet, I represent a, a large university in my constituency. And the young people I meet there absolutely understand uh, that it's right that they make a contribution uh, to the cost of their courses. They're the ones who are going to uh, benefit uh, from it. And of course, people don't pay the fees up front. It's something they pay back over the course of uh, 30, 30 years. So it is the right system to have in place. It's the right one, as I say, to put universities on a sustainable foot. And that was Nicky Morgan, who then went completely unchallenged by John Humphreys, despite the blatant lie she'd just engaged in. At no point after the election, and this is an important point, at no point after the election did anyone in the Labour Party row back on the promise to abolish tuition fees? It's in the manifesto. It continues to be in the manifesto. And John Humphreys, who you would think would know this quite basic political fact, right? This is a man who is supposed to be the BBC's, one of B the BBC's top interviewers, top political journalists, should have looked at Nicky Morgan and said, you are lying. And what you're doing here is you know that you probably won't be challenged on this on the show. And you can get away with you know, seeding this idea into the ears and brains of the listeners to the Today programme. Mm. And these are not the people who will be listening 45 minutes later when John Humphreys, in a very brief and very hurried aside, said, oh, well, apparently that wasn't true. He should be, if he were even halfway, basically journalistically competent. And this is important because the Today programme sets the agenda for the news cycle of the day. Undoubtedly the most important show on radio, right? And... He is incapable of doing the basic journalistic competence of challenging her. Why is he on, there? Uh, he's there because basically he's not dead yet. I mean, I'm baffling that he's not, you know, the man should retire, really. Get Carrie Gracie in. <laughs> Carrie Gracie. The, the movement starts here. Carrie Gracie to present the Today programme. So what I think is important here is it tells us two things. One is that Nikki Morgan is a snake and knows what she's doing. She's not, I mean, she's not bright, but she knows what she's doing in this circumstance, which is that she's going on there to feed a story like this into the, into, you know, into the people who are listening, you know, and hopefully into the press and get picked up. Um, so, so that's important. She knows what she's doing there. And the press is astonishingly incompetent. The press is incapable of digging into the most basic story here. This is a very, very basic story. You know, key fact that you will remember in the difference between the policies of the Conservative Party and the Labour Party from the election last year. One doesn't want to touch tuition fees, the other one wants to abolish them. That is quite basic. But also what I think a lot of them don't understand within the media, people like John Humphreys, Labour's policy has decided democratically. Yeah, it, with the Tories, Theresa May sort of writes it on a napkin and Nick Timothy sort of telling her down WhatsApp what to put in the manifesto on the Mensch tax, for instance. Yeah. The Labour Party manifesto is democratically agreed to. It goes through the NEC. You have some input from the National Policy Forum. You know, you can't just change stuff on the hoof. And obviously what she's trying to do here is she's creating a false ambiguity between liquidating existing student debt and getting rid of the fees. Mm. And this is a perennial feature of how the Tories seek to discredit Corbyn, is this false ambiguity. It's the exact same with the this check stuff, right? So they're saying almost immediately, as Newton Dunn did, James Cleverly said it very quickly, or oh, it's not really true, but... How can we trust somebody who maybe could have been in such a position, you know, talking potentially mm. to a Czech ambassador? He's, you know, or a, a diplomat. Of course he can talk to a Czech diplomat. Why not? Yeah, I mean, Tom Newton Dunn should have ended that tweet there, right? Like, that it's not true. He said, I mean, he, the first bit of the tweet is saying, if we can get the Tom Newton Dunn tweet up from earlier on, he literally says, yeah, here we go. There's little hard evidence Corbyn was a paid up supply. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the tweet. That's the tweet. There you go. There you go. You lying bastard. <laughs> well, Leveson 2 is going to come on and, and unroll these people, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, so, yeah, that, that is Theresa May. So she's falling back on Timothyism. Um, you, know, it's you know, it's worth saying that this is a sign of a really, really weak prime minister uh, and someone who is dead out of ideas. Weakest prime minister ever? Certainly of the last hundred years, I oh, think. It's pretty impressive, yeah. and, and nobody has the capacity to act... Uh, decisively. No, no, no. That's it, I think. I don't think we have anything more to say about these people. I mean, it's just been an astonishing week. I, I you know, I, I, I continue to be utterly amazed at the state of the British press. 
I continue to be utterly amazed that Theresa May hasn't sort of run screaming to Antarctica or somewhere. Mm. You know, she must feel the knives are out for her. Um, yeah, no, so this week has been, uh, I have just been, you know, it's been jaw dropping. And my feeling is, is that this Czech stuff is going to run and run and run. And it's running on fumes. There's nothing there. And I hope, I genuinely do hope, that if this kind of libel is repeated by MPs, absent parliamentary privilege, you can't be sued for libel for what you say in the House of Commons, mm. but if people, if you know, Tory MPs are tweeting this kind of nonsense out and doing this kind of signalling to hard right people, like Thomas Mayer was, I hope Corbyn does sue them, and I hope that he sues them, you know, to, you know, to beggary. Those are Hopkins. Yeah. They have to sell their homes. Go and take ketamine in South Africa. That'd be great. I mean, for me, the, I, I, I couldn't agree more. These two stories for me bring together the fact that we have a system in freefall, a system of consent as well as a system of politics. And you see it with Carillion, you saw it with Grenfell, uh, you saw it with the HDV stuff. And actually, they went right through the Labour Party as much as being a, an issue between the two major parties. And now you see it with this Czech, this Czech spy nonsense and tuition fees this week. Neoliberalism and the consent that was behind it is gone. Uh, and we don't really know what's coming next, do we? Yeah, but it's an exciting time. Great. Well, we'll see you next Monday on The Fix. We will indeed. Bye. Bye-bye.